All those in favour say aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. That is carried. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. And the uh, next item on the agenda is the uh, housing and business development capacity, item number 18. Um, Richard, does anyone have any questions of Richard? Or, or has this come through a committee? Sorry, I'm just behind. No. So um, has anyone got any questions of Richard on this one? Yani? I mean, I don't know if it's, it's appropriate to deal with it here, but I do think we need to do some work around the, um, I think we were going to have double the capacity that we actually needed and what that means in terms of housing and land supply, infrastructure costs um, and affordability. So do you think there's a need to have, I mean the question is really, do you think there's a need to have a greater economic kind of understanding about what the risks are to having so much available land? Yeah. Um, th th these figures are at a pretty broad level. Uh, I think, th th so the short answer to your um, question is um, yes, but the, the real issue here is how much of that land is actually feasible to develop. And that's part of the work that we need to do as part of the national policy statement work over the next six months, is to get a, a much closer figure around how much of the, of, of the uh, greenfield land can be developed over what period of time. I mean, the, the servicing constraints are not so much the issue. It is the things that, you know, the, a lot of the greenfield land is in quite tricky land to develop and it's in fragmented ownership. So it's going to be quite slow to develop. Um, the intensification areas have got the same issue with fragmented land uh, as well. So these theoretical capacities need to be thought through in, in, in more detail and we've got an obligation under the MPS to do that. Um, but, you know, go back to your original question, um, along the line we should look at yeah, what, what is the economic impact, I mean both positive and negative. Um, there will be positive impacts because people will um, be able to come to Christchurch and find somewhere to live quite easily. Um, whether there are any negative impacts on the on the market as a result, well, that's something which we'd need to look at. Yeah, I guess, I mean, yeah. So, I mean, one of the concerns that we've had has been raised is around, um, you know, we've got all these areas that we're trying to encourage investment into, but if we've got an oversupply of existing properties, then actually that investment doesn't stack up in terms of new builds? Yeah, but the the, uh, the market tends to have peaks and troughs, so it's, it's, and, and you, there'll be periods of oversupply and there'll be periods of undersupply. What we're trying to do is smooth that out a little bit. But it, it's really hard to manage, to micromanage that sort of thing, really, I think, Councillor Johansson. Uh, um, but, but I think your point is a valid one. It's just something we need to look at as we go through the assessments that we have to do under the NPS. Great, thanks. Yep, um, Glenn. Thank you, and I note there are a number of papers over, you know, the affordability and land supply question today. But my question in, in relation to this is that, given that we are 37 percent uh, over capacity as required, and given that we've seen a slight Kind of easing off in housing prices in Christchurch. Can you see any, um, or is there any, in your view, any evidence over a causal link between the, um, the, the increased supply of land and dropping house prices? Because that's the theory, that's the prior assumption that if, if you open up, um, you know, supply, hmm. the prices will drop. Now I'm, I've got my views on that. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not seeing any. Think plummeting. So, have you got? Can you see any kind of causal link evidence? I think it's a contributing factor. I think the fact that we've got um, a, a reasonable supply of land has moderated uh, Christchurch's um, increase in, in house and land prices you know, compared to other centres. Um, but when you look back around the history of section and land prices around the city, going back. You know, even 20 years, we've always been around the national average, irrespective of land supply. You know, we, apart from a few blips, um, where we've had constraint. You know, we we uh, had um, periods where sections have been slow to come on the market. There's been a slight increase, but it's more tied to things like migration and demand than just straight supply. There is an interaction. 
But, I mean, to go back to your original question, I think that, yeah, the fact that we've got quite a bit of capacity is helping to keep houses at a more affordable level. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Simon. Yeah. Uh, Vicky uh, under, Dion. Under the conditions that are outlined here in the LERP, what does Housing New Zealand have to do in Brindwood and Shirley where those houses are being offered for sale? So I think that the LERP questions are part of the next report, so Sorry. Um, but we can come back Take to that one if that's okay. Yep. So the, the two are linked. Dion? Um, I'm not sure where it was referenced, in, well, I don't think it is referenced in this report, but I just keep mindful of the residential red zone, the land that's there, what the potential reuses of that are going to be. How would that impact on what we're doing here, or what this report is? So look, we really don't know what that looks like. Obviously, we've got a, an outline which has been approved yet to be gazetted, I think. But but I don't have a handle on what might be coming to the market in terms of development of, of that. But it's something we need to build in. I mean, I think one of the things with Christchurch is that we have a lot of particular greenfield supply, and um, technically we have a lot of intensification capacity, but we don't necessarily have a lot of housing choice. So you know, it's it's one of those things where. There's a lot of greenfield stuff out there, but uh, we don't necessarily have a lot of uh, opportunity for medium density development, and that's not coming to the market. So, you know, if, if parts of the red zone were to be developed for that purpose, um, that might have a different market offering than what we currently see, and that might be attractive. So, and would that affect the the actual the, the total housing package that's trying to be achieved with this? Potentially, mm. yeah. We, we, we don't know what that looks like, though. Uh, I think that the, the other important thing to bear in mind here is the distribution of development potential is quite skewed. So, and, and deliberately so, it's been planned that most of our vacant land is down the north, uh, up the northeast and southwest corridors. Um, the east, I think, the eastern. There's very little vacant land in the eastern suburbs, um, relatively speaking, as, uh, other than Preston's. I mean, that's that. that, that put that to one side, but. So this needs to be looked at as a, in a geographic sense as well. I mean, uh, it, it was just a broad theoretical capacity. Um, and in terms of comparative location advantages of some areas over others. So it's, a, it's, 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 no, it's not a precise science, actually. And is this going to potentially um, restrict the, 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 what am I trying to say, is this potentially going to restrict the attractiveness of say the central city in terms of intensificating or intensifying the development here, obviously there's a fair bit of land that needs to be developed and we have got a goal of having 20,000 people living within the central city, um, you know that would make that vibrant and part of the recovery plan. <laughs> Is opening up these greenfields and doing all this work actually taking away that precedence to actually sort of look at the central city as an attractive place to invest? For these, the these greenfields have already been opened up. These, these, are, these are planned from um, the old PC, PC1 days through the LERP, earthquake recovery, so they're there. Um, but uh, at a, looking at a UDS perspective, I think that's a, a pretty important issue that um, decentralisation of, of both jobs and housing is something that needs to be seriously looked at so the existing uh, inner suburbs and central city don't lose that potential to redevelop and, and um, to be re you know, to, to, to attract people back in there. That is, that is a major question for uh, uh, probably as part of the UDS review. Yeah. Phil? Thank you. Thanks. Ivan, can I ask you, like in the report, um, on, in 4.8, there's reference to the um, intensification and infill being um, in broadly 30,000 households. Okay, that's on our page 234 of the report. Yeah. So 30,000 households and intensification, that's obviously like uh, another town almost, um, in addition to the current population. So what I'm driving at is are we able and how can we make sure that we have our infrastructure strategy uh, aligned with this kind of potential growth. Mm, that's a very, that's, and that's very important. A lot of that infill, though, is going to be soft infill. Uh, it's, it's, it, you know, whether it's retirement villages, uh, the community housing redevelopment mechanisms, 
as well as the central city, inner suburbs, and KAC intensification. So a lot of that infra will be spread around, so it will have a marginal effect on, on infrastructure. It's not going to have a sudden impact. What will have a sudden impact if there was quite a concentration of infill in a one area at the one, at the one time, where you start reaching thresholds? But a lot of this in infill will happen quite gradually over most of the city, apart from some areas, hopefully, areas where we want it to happen, around the key activity centres and around the central city, it will happen more quickly, and we need to make sure the infrastructure is in place for that. So we'll be able to monitor that and make sure that that is brought into the infrastructure strategy? We're required to now under the NPC. Okay. Uh, uh, NPC. NPS. <laughs> NPS. Yeah, we're, not, we're not talking rugby. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, MPS. But, but I, I, one of the points I'd like to make about that 30,000 is that that is very much a theoretical capacity. So um, what the MPS requires of us is to work out, you know, just how theoretical that is and how realistic it is. And they've recently released a tool to uh, in draft to help us with yeah. that. Yeah. Pauline? Yeah, I just want clarification. I don't quite understand that but So you're saying the potential capacity from infill and intensification is broadly 30,000. The current capacity is around 45,000. What well, I don't understand that. Can you? Oh, that's adding greenfields in there too. I think. Oh, yeah, yeah, greenfield variety plus areas. That's, that's a greenfield as well. So we've actually got an abundance yeah. of supply if we're actually aiming for 23,000. But the next sentence is this is a theoretical capacity. Yes, I know, but it's um. Yeah, that, that's on a conservative side. Perhaps? Yeah, but it's probably two different time frames here. Um, the, the 2028 figure, you know, the, the 23,700 is up to 2028. So the, the rest of it is likely to be carry on past 2028. So you're looking at uh, you know, two different time periods. So up until 2028, some of that 30,000 or 45,000 will be used up. Beyond then, I think the council will need to look at how it's going to actually, uh, you know, it may not decide to zone, rezone any more land. It may be, it may be fine, but it's, it's 2028, it probably needs to take stock and uh, through its monitoring process and see how it's going to respond if there's still an, if there's still a large, you know, yeah, yeah. Yeah, thank you. That's explained it really well, and that's where I was actually yeah. uh, coming from. There's no, there's no urgent hurry right now to identify more. Yeah, yeah. I think the key thing for us is the intensification and how do we get that how to we get, yeah. work and how realistic is that 30,000 household yeah. figure because it, it is theoretical and um, you know you, particularly in Christchurch where you've had a lot of um, um, properties where the, the dwellings have been upgraded post quake and you know they're quite valuable um, assets so the, the desire and the marketability of those uh, areas to be w redeveloped is, is probably a little bit lower because the value of the assets quite high so you wouldn't go on and bowl that and if the house is sitting in the middle of the site um, it's, it's not going to be attractive for a developer to do that mm -hmm. potentially so theoretical capacity is one thing, realistic capacity is another, and that's what we need to do some work on to fulfil the NPS obligations. Yeah. Good. So would someone like to move? Um, comment on it. I think this actually... Oh, uh, I'd like a motion oh, first, sorry. then okay. you can speak yep. to it. Um, Phil, uh, seconded Glenn. Sorry, I thought you were just oh, going to put it. Okay. Um, <laughs> no, I wasn't. I was looking for a mover and a second. Um, I just wanted okay. to... Say, want to say thank you for the report it's actually this and all the subsequent ones are actually really interesting um, and I think it's the sort of problem that Auckland Wellington Queenstown uh, they would love to see this report like the fact that we've got these options the sufficient industrial land the sufficient greenfields residential land the sufficient brownfields residential land and uh, we may not need all of what's currently zoned although there's a whole lot of unknowns about it is a lovely housing report to get um, I, I, I think it's brilliant <laughs> because it means that what we can look at doing um, that other cities can't is one actually housing everybody affordably um, albeit not to the six star green standard that we would have liked in the district plan that the government said no to um, but we can we can house we can actually seriously look at housing everybody affordably in Christchurch um, we can um, actually tell people that housing is affordable here. I was speaking to a group who were over with the driverless electric vehicle work. They're from Melbourne. They were sort of 29, early 30s. Early 30s. 
They were looking at housing here and discovering it for 400,000 as opposed to 1.4 million in Melbourne and saying we want to relocate. <laughs> We'd really like our office to be here because we could afford to buy houses in Melbourne, Auckland, yep. Queenstown, they can't. And I think that's a huge advantage um, for for any city, especially for Christchurch. It also means that we can look at innovative solutions to housing, rent to own, shared equity, all sorts of things that help people get into their own house at a time when probably paying mortgage is just as cheap as paying rent uh, because rent house prices are quite static, rents have fallen um, and, and interest rates are quite low. So we're open to all sorts of innovative projects. We have actually suggested that that be part of what the housing accord, the ongoing housing accord includes. It will be interesting to see the response on that. Um, but certainly in terms of shared equity there is some capacities in Christchurch to do things that no other city at the moment can look at doing. Very good. Uh, Glenn? Thank you, and thank you for this report, uh, this report and your responses. Uh, still curious over our overall housing situation, and I take your comments, Ivan, that uh, you know that the land supply is probably keeping that, that lid on things, uh, but um, I think it's important we just keep our foot on the accelerator and we take nothing for granted. We still have work, I think, uh, over uh, land banking, are we conversation, Tim, and also over, um, you know, I think we still need to address, is there enough competition in the marketplace over construction prices? Mm -hmm. I think there's another piece of work we need to look at as well. Yeah. Um, we really have to take a 360 look at this. The big theory over supply and demand, uh, increased demand over land, we're well exceeding what's being asked of us. It might be keeping a lid on house prices, but is it actually really driving them down? So we'll come to the Rickerton report a bit later, and we'll all have our own thoughts over what is affordability. We've got a policy over that too. But um, yeah, let's just keep pushing it forward. Looks good compared to Auckland, but I, I still think it's an ongoing dynamic process, and we, we've really got to try and do what we can to, to drive the prices down from our angle. Yep. Uh, sorry, Yanni. Um, just to back up those comments that have been made, that I think this is a really good starting point. But you know, some of the bigger questions about um, who, how many people own something, and how how many people own absolutely nothing. And so, you know, if you looked at this in terms of where development is occurring and what type of development and for whom, mm. and who benefits, I think you would get a very different mm. picture. Um, so. You know, I think this is a good start, but it doesn't actually address some of those fundamental issues around addressing inequity in our city, um, and you know, simply just having land available for people to make even you know greater profits at the expense of those who can least afford it. Um, you know, may not be the thing that we want to support, but again, having the information underneath this, I think would be really interesting around you know the way in which developments occurring, and you know, to give you another example, the way in which social housing is being intensified in the south and the east um, and and you know to the north and the west where the new greenfields are there's very little social housing being built um, is an area of concern so we see some quite dramatic social impacts of, of what happens also again if you look at things like jobs in the east going to the west and into the new land uh, that's been opened up again having quite a profound impact in some areas you know the older traditional working class suburbs of Christchurch. So I think it's a good start. I look forward to that additional work being done. Um, and I totally agree with Vicky that, you know, we, we are in a really unique situation that we could do the most amazing things in terms of enabling uh, people to actually own something, you know, own their house or own their business. Much greater than opportunity than just about any other city in New Zealand, I would have thought, mm -hmm. because of our situation. So looking at those things, I think, is logically the next step in this pro process so that we can get really clear around you know, the, the, the old four well-beings that were in the Local Government Act, not just the economic but actually the social, the community and the cultural. But thank you for the work that you've done on it. Very good. I'll put that motion. All those in